Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship. I thank the Lord that you're here. I ask that you please stand as we sing together our opening hymn. That's hymn 578, Thy Strong Word. We'll sing the first three verses. into all the promises of God as we remember our baptism in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please join me in confession. We are your baptized children, O God, fed by your word and led by your spirit. But we are also sinners. Therefore, we confess before you this day that we have often been led astray by the devil, the world, and our sinful flesh. We have often fed our minds with worldly filth rather than with your divine teaching. In thought, word, and action, we have sinned against you. Forgive our sin for Jesus' sake. Feed us with your pure word and your sacraments, and guide us in your ways. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to be the one true shepherd who has died for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained servant of the word and by his authority, 
I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. For our discipleship uh, point for this morning, we're going to borrow from our small group study. We have uh, five groups now reading through this book, Love Does. I'm going to share just a little bit uh, from that this morning with you. Uh, from the Love Does study, in the uh, first session, part of the homework that was given are activities that are simply described as do. I'm sharing with you today this homework uh, for the coming week. In the, in the video, Bob tells a compelling story about a time in which he quit high school and he made a plan to go and visit Yosemite National Park to rock climb. And you are invited to do the same this week. Uh, not quit high school, and for some of us, rock climbing is not a good idea right now. But to do what Bob did in this, uh, to pick something in this life that you need to give up right now. Something that you just simply need to give up, right? And, and then maybe something that you enjoy, but decide uh, to put aside for a certain amount of time, right? It could be um, uh, time spent on the computer uh, after dinner. It could be uh, a show that you've been watching and you just, you just give it up for a certain period of time. And the point is this, that when we quit things, it makes space for Jesus to bring in new things into our lives. And the encouragement is to not rush to fill this new time or emotional space with some replacement noise or activity or entertainment, but instead just to pay attention and to be in prayer, to see what Jesus brings into our lives so that we're able to say yes to it. Will you please join me in prayer? Dear Father, give us the wisdom to know what to let go and give us the peace of trusting that you're in control. May we give this time back to you in loving service. In Jesus' name, amen. Together we sing uh, the hymn of praise. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. first reading for today comes from 2 Samuel, chapter 11. 
It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is from Acts chapter 15. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. <clears throat> the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. This is the gospel of the Lord. Hymn 645, Built on the Rock.
grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, who is Jesus Christ. Amen. He had sinned against his wife. He had um, betrayed a friend. He involved other people in his indiscretion. He had let his uh, self-centeredness, his vanity, his lack of self-control take over his life. People close to him lost their lives as a result. And that wasn't even the worst part. The worst part is he got away with it. He got away with it. No, nobody knew. Nothing on the outside changed. But, but inside, inside, he was dying. Now let's hear it in his own words. For when I kept silent, my bones, they wasted away through my groaning all day long. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. That's how King David describes a life of trying to hide sin. And for many of us, our, our indiscretions, our, our mix-ups, they're different than that. But the feeling, the feeling is the same. We silently carry uh, sacks of sin on our back that feel as though they're uh, big enough to crush us, uh, making us want to uh, cry out. But we uh, remain silent as to avoid being noticed. Or maybe the, the weight that you're carrying on your back today is the hurt that you feel from being wronged. Your inability to let go of what's been done to you. As King David so vividly puts it for us, we silently groan all day long under this pressure. The extra weight that we're carrying around with us, it's as if our bones are wasting away. Our strength to meet the challenges of the day does not feel as though it's enough. Uh, the vitality that we've had for life feels sapped, as if it's just been all dried up. That is until we experience truly this gift that God gives us called forgiveness. And my encouragement to all of us here this morning is, is this. Forgiveness is exactly what we need. We need to receive it. We need to share it with one another. Because forgiveness is the good news of the gospel. And to speak for a moment about us collectively as a church family, it's exactly what we need to be known for here as uh, Christ's church in this community. We need to be known for our forgiveness. See, if we don't forgive, ultimately, we harm ourselves. And if we believe we cannot be forgiven, over time, we just waste away. And as a, as a church family, if this is not a place of grace, where we believe in the practice of reconciliation, well, our disagreements will ground a halt all forward progress that we're trying to make. We have dedicated now uh, many months to uh, focusing on shaping our collective heart toward God's mission in this place so that we may be people who are about what God desires for us to be about, seeking and saving the lost, caring for those who do not yet know him. And when we become truly aligned with God's mission, what God is doing here, and when we're working together in that direction, there is absolutely nothing that is impossible for us. And there is nothing that can stop us, except maybe us. If we don't prioritize living at peace with one another, God will not continue to bless this community through our church. 
Instead, we'll get caught up in things like bickering and gossip, and we'll spend way too much time and energy on petty, silly stuff. And we will wander in a desert. God's done that before, you know. And it doesn't mean that uh, as a whole we have to agree on absolutely everything. In fact, it would be really weird if we did. At the end of the day, uh, conflicts and disagreements, they're, uh, they're just simply unavoidable. But thank God they don't actually have the power to control us, and they don't have the power to stop us, unless we give it to them. And so the question for us this morning is this, is, is conflict or disagreement dominating your thoughts and feelings? And here's, here's one litmus test. How, how do you feel when you walk through these doors? Do you feel more judged or loved? Right? Because God's grace is held out uh, for each and every one of us. And if you're walking around uh, today feeling judged, then we have to examine what exactly is broken. And if that is happening to you in any other facet of your life, if you're spending uh, just too much time and energy wrapped up in conflict, we need to turn that back over to God today. As we have continued reading through uh, the book of Acts as part of our uh, readings and worship, we're, we're understanding how God's church first came to be. And we get to this 15th chapter today and we run into a problem. There's a segment of the church wanting to carry forward old Jewish laws and try to impose them on everybody who's uh, coming into the church. It it's seems to be an effort to make a distinction between the originals and uh, those who are just now coming to faith. And yet it's more than that. It, in a sense, becomes an argument over who really can be Christian. And is God's love sufficient for everyone? And with wisdom and humility, the church comes together hearing uh, testimony, searching the scripture, they decide rightly that God's heart is for the whole world. And so they agree to revisit their requirements and they decide emphatically that they do not want to be in the business of keeping people on the outside of church. And yet, we, we read to the end of that 15th chapter, and we now have Paul and Barnabas at odds with each other to the point that they just simply have to go their separate ways because they cannot agree on anything. And so again, I ask, how much of your energy today is sapped by bickering? And how much of your life feels like it's being spent, wrapped up in conflict? And what good news exists for those who are just plain weary of arguing? We go to our gospel lesson. Peter asked Jesus, how many times, how many times do I need to forgive my brother? And he throws out this number of seven, thinking that he's being very generous. The uh, common thought of the day, what was taught by rabbis, is that holy behavior would necessitate that we need to forgive a person up to three times for the sin that they've committed. So he assumes if he, knowing that Jesus is uh, different than the rest, if he throws out seven, maybe that, maybe that will suffice. And Jesus says, not seven, but 77, or depending on your translation, uh, uh, seven times 70. And before you try to do uh, all that high-level math in your head, Jesus' point is simply this, right? There is not a number. There is not a number. Forgiveness is a gift that comes from God with an unlimited supply. It has no limits. Right? When you have time, I encourage you to read the 18th chapter of Matthew in its entirety. If you read that chapter from beginning to end, you will see a lot of God's perspective on sin and God's heart and desire for us not to get trapped up in it but uh, for the purpose of our uh, time together this morning, where do we go? I'd rather we spend a little bit more time on this understanding of what forgiveness truly is. Right? And I would say this, that first, 
Forgiveness requires truth. Forgiveness is not possible when we insist on keeping things in the dark. Right? Now, truth by itself does not equal forgiveness. But it is a really necessary ingredient. Uh, go back to David for a minute. As long as David tried to hide his sins, he, he suffered the effects of not being forgiven. When we think about extending forgiveness to someone else, we need to recognize this, that our love for them is not simply enough. Loving and caring about a person will not be enough to open up forgiveness. Really, to understand what, what this forgiveness is, it's good to first clarify what it isn't. Right? Forgiveness is not getting even. And forgiveness is not being tough. And forgiveness is not bearing a grudge, which in essence is, is wanting to get even, uh, but just settling for making everybody else around you miserable. Right? Forgiveness is not holding on, which inevitably will result in a major blow up at a majorly wrong time. Forgiveness is not understanding it. And that's where so often we go off track. And you think about the last time you were in a conflict, and often, uh, often they sound a lot like this. I'm so sorry for what I said to you, but you need to understand. And the other person will say, I understand, it's all right. The truth is this, while understanding is a, is a good thing, Right? There are going to be sins that we simply cannot comprehend. Evil is something that shouldn't be intuitive to us. We should not always understand it. And the good news is this. We don't need to understand to forgive. Understanding is not a part of forgiveness. And forgiveness is not weakness. And forgiveness is not being tough. Forgiveness begins with the reality that this hurts. This hurts, and the person who has offended me needs to know that. That's that moment of truth. It's living in the light. For us, forgiveness begins with saying Jesus died for this sin and realizing that that is always true no matter how I feel about it. Forgiveness does not mean that we need to forget the sin. This is another uh, place where we often uh, head in the wrong direction. We, we think that uh, we are expected, uh, that we need to forget what has gone wrong. And there is, is no place in Scripture where God commands us to forget a sin that's been committed against us. And the Bible tells us this, that every time we confess our sins, God chooses to forget them. Remember that, that concept of scattering them as far as the east is from the west. But we, we are not God. And God does not place that responsibility on us. Instead, we are to remember the sin in red meaning covered in the blood of Christ. And think about how that works practically for a moment, right? We can forgive the person who has harmed our children, but it would be foolish to then hire them as our babysitter. Right? We can uh, forgive the person who has stolen from us but it would be silly to bring them on as our accountant. We are, we are not called uh, to forget sin. But in faith, we remember it differently. And forgiveness has an impact on the forgiver and the forgiven. Ultimately, that impact is it changes the way we see people no matter what they've done. 
and separate from what they've done. But ultimately, if we're being honest, forgiveness is a risky thing. It's a risky thing because when you forgive somebody, you have no assurance that they're not going to do it again. We cannot truly forgive somebody while setting ourselves up in a way that we can never be harmed again. Uh, to do that, right, to do that really is, is not to truly forgive. And sometimes our hurts are so deep. And healing takes more time than we could imagine. And yet, there is always the possibility in a relationship where forgiveness is real, there's always the possibility that not only will this matter ultimately be repaired, but that this relationship in the end will ultimately be stronger. Again, the basic steps of forgiveness are simply this. It begins with living in the light, with telling the truth, and when acknowledging when something is wrong. And then the, the next step is uh, typically to avoid our first reaction, which is either uh, to run away or uh, to retaliate. And then to confess that Jesus has died for the sin and so much more for the sinner. And then to promise ourselves and the other people involved that we'll remember this red, covered in the blood of Christ. When we remember something red, that's the moment we begin dealing in reality. We're dealing in reality because we still see the sin for what it is. The sin is real. It is hurtful. It is, at times, even deadly. But we see forgiveness as more than simply words that are there to make us feel better. We know that it's something that we absolutely need. And because forgiveness is something that you and I both need, God has not left it to us to create. He doesn't expect us to find a way to muster up the ability to, to lead a sin-free life. He doesn't expect us to be able to discipline ourselves to the point of being able to offer forgiveness simply out of the kindness and generosity of our own heart. Instead, God forgives us. And he forgives us. And he forgives us. And he forgives us with such wild generosity that in time we realize that there is enough left there for us to extend it to other people. This forgiveness is the center of the good news of Jesus Christ. It is the reason that God humbled himself to become a man to live among us. It is the reason for the cross. It is the reality of the empty tomb. Christ came so that nothing at all, nothing at all could ever separate us from the love of God. Nothing. Our forgiveness has been won in Jesus' victory. It's been extended to us in our baptism. It is renewed every time we hear that good news of the gospel. It is given to us in a supply generous enough to share with others. And as the church here in this community, it's what we need to be known for. We need to be the place of unconditional love. Where reconcilia reconciliation is real and where forgiveness just flows. We need to be that because this community needs us to be that. Because so many people are walking around carrying so much extra weight, so much guilt and shame and regret. And the truth of the world is this. Medicine can only numb that pain. And counseling can only help us to process that pain. But when we're walking around with the weight of sin hanging around your neck, you don't need understanding as much as you need forgiveness. Right? Uh, picture it again like this. Tomorrow, you get up, and you go into your doctor, you tell your doctor, I'm pretty sure I'm dying. 
doctor looks at you and says, I understand. Or the doctor says, I can relate to that. Or uh, the doctor says, trying to distract you, hey, how about them Buffalo Bills? Right? In time, you would grow so frustrated, you'd storm right out of that office, and you'd go to the very next place you could go to in the hopes of finding a cure. But the reality is this. These are the same answers that the world is giving to people who are dying for sin right now. And we, as God's church, we have the cure. Because forgiveness is the only thing, when it comes down to it, that truly makes a difference. When finally confronted with the truth of his actions, David came clean. He confessed. He confessed. He begged God for forgiveness. David says, I confess my transgressions to the Lord. You forgave the iniquity of my sin. You are a hiding place for me because you preserve me from trouble and you surround me with shouts of deliverance. Blessed is the one whose sins are forgiven, whose sins have been covered over. And blessed are we today to be people who have received this gift of forgiveness in such an abundance that we have the ability to share it with others. May it free us to be the grace that so many people in this community need. Amen. <clears throat> Will you please join me as we share together common confession of our faith as found in the creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In our time of offering this day, I want to continue our discussion of reviewing uh, basic biblical principles when it comes to giving. Last week we talked about giving as a priority, uh, that what we give to and how we give uh, talks about what matters to us most. Uh, today uh, I share with you the second principle, which is this, giving is to be done proportionally. Right? The Bible uh, often talks about this concept of tithing, giving uh, 10% and returning that to the Lord. When we give based on uh, percentages, what we're doing is we're turning over our giving back to God. If God blesses us this day with a little, then we give a percentage of that little uh, back to him. If God blesses us today in abundance, then we give that percentage of abundance uh, back to him. Uh, giving proportionally is all about our relationship with God. Understand that God is the giver of all things. And what I have, whether it is, is just enough or is exceedingly generous, what I have is God's gift to me. And therefore, um, by giving proportionally, we leave ultimately our giving back in the hands of the giver. I encourage you to consider that. I also want to share with you uh, that as you continue to be uh, uniquely generous people, our uh, offering out here of thanksgiving for the community 
uh, you've created a problem. We've already reached our goal and surpassed it. We have uh, more items uh, than they had asked for us to collect. Uh, and so we want to take that problem and make it into an opportunity. And I got a letter uh, this last week from our friends at Community Lutheran in the city of Rochester uh, from Miss Maggie, and they are preparing uh, for a Thanksgiving meal, and they are in need of some supplies. I'm going to read to you some of the items that they're looking for, and I thought we could add these to our collection. We'll also send these items out to you this week, so you don't have to commit this to memory, but just so you know. Uh, they're in need of green beans, gravy, corn, butter, cornbread stuffing, rolls, salt and pepper shakers, decaf and regular coffee, tea, Kool-Aid, and salad dressing. These are the items I thought we could collect over the next couple of weeks and send them to the city of Rochester to help them. Also wanted to let you know that part of uh, their letter to us is that uh, they are looking for more volunteers to help serve the community this meal. If you have an interest in that, please just seek me out and I'll help connect you uh, with those folks downtown uh, for what would be a wonderful opportunity. We continue now with the prayers of the church. As we come to God in prayer this day, uh, we uh, add to our list uh, today, we pray for the family of uh, Timothy List. Uh, his calling hours will be held here uh, this afternoon. His service will be here uh, tomorrow. Uh, Timothy served uh, the community uh, throughout his life, uh, but uh, for the longest period of time in the Rochester Police Department. Uh, and so we just pray for his family and friends. Uh, we pray this day for Weedy. Weedy is uh, Chris Riley's mother, uh, and she fell and broke her hip and is in the hospital, and so we just uh, pray for her. Uh, we also add to the list of those with health struggles today, Andrea. Uh, we bring these prayers and many more before the Lord, if you'll please join me. In gratitude and humility, let us now join together in prayer on behalf of all God's creation. God of mercy, you are in the midst of us, and we are called by your name. Inspire your church to serve and love all people with the unceasing grace that you extend to us. And God of all creation, you formed a world where even the sparrow finds a home. Preserve the beauty and diversity of all creatures with whom we share this earth. Lead us to protect all living things. God of peace, you are an ever-present help in time of trouble. Rescue families and nations who are torn apart by violence and warfare. Unite all people toward a common goal of reconciliation and peace for every person. God of hope, you stand with all the suffering. You give strength. Comfort your people, those who are filled with fear or anger, anxiety or shame, and be healing to all who are sick in body or mind or spirit. Today, God, we pray for Weedy. We pray for Tom, for Andrea, for Shelley and for Connie recovering from their surgeries, for Ashley and Loretta, for Steve, for Bob, who has been moved into hospice care, for Nadine, for Aaron, for Chris and Mike and Judy, for Holly and Dale and Carl, for Audrey and Carol and Marty, for Ali and Eddie. We pray this day for those we know battling cancer, for Janet and Carol, for Chris and Mary Ann, 
for Bruce and Ryan, for Heidi and Kim, for Paul and Barb, for Marnie and Dan and Cheryl, for Steve and Irma, for Henry and John, for Beverly and Jackie. We call out to you now with the names of those on our heart. Lord, that all who call on your name will be comforted by your presence and will find peace. We pray, uh, God of eternal life, that to you be glory forever. We give you thanks for those who have fought the good fight and finished the race and kept the faith and now live with you. Today we pray for those who mourn. We especially pray for the family and the friends of Timothy. With grateful hearts, we commend our spoken and silent prayers to you, O God, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Will you please stand for the service of the sacrament? The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who out of love for his fallen creation humbled himself by taking on the form of a servant, becoming obedient unto death, even death upon a cross. Risen from the dead, he has freed us from eternal death and given us life everlasting. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created. You've sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. And gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom. Teach us now to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. When he'd given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Depart now with your heavenly Father's joy and with his favor. This is the blood of the part of our Lord and Savior, Amen. Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of sins. Now go forth with joy and peace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Heavenly Father's joy and with his peace. Let us pray. We have thanks you, Almighty God, that you've refreshed us through this salutary gift. We implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Just a couple of reminders for the week. Um, two upcoming uh, events. Um, this first one is com this coming Saturday. It's our Young at Heart luncheon. Uh, if you have not yet signed up, uh, the good news is there's still time. So the sign-up sheet is across from the mailboxes out here. Just please sign your name. Uh, if you'd like to bring something to the luncheon, you can put that next to your name. But most of all, we just love to have you with us this coming Saturday. Uh, secondly, uh, St. Paul Night Out. That's our uh, fun night over at the exempt hall. Time for dinner and uh, fun with your friends. Uh, tickets are on sale right after service today in the office. We'd love for you uh, to get a ticket and to join us for that. 
And then just an update, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, we shared with you uh, that uh, one of our uh, St. Paul family members had uh, issued a, a challenge to us to start accelerating the pay down of our mortgage. They uh, made a gift of $25,000 with the goal of the congregation trying to match that. Uh, to date, we're just a little shy of $6,000 toward that goal. Uh, so that's a good start. Uh, we'll just keep working at it. And with that, we continue now uh, as we sing together uh, hymn 578, Thy Strong Word, verses 4 through 6. Okay. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. <laughs>